Welcome to this issue of Radon Continuing Education. My name is Dr. Paul Houle, and I'm going to guide you through this program, the title of which, as you can see here on your monitor, is A Citizen's Guide to Radon. Now, this is an EPA publication, and you have it in your book that came along with the video. You'll find that um, almost the last item in the book, and later on, after the program is over, if you want to peruse that particular document, that's a good idea. Before we go too far into the program, what I'd like you to notice in your book is the first couple of pages of the book is actually what I call a study guide. And it lists for you an array of objectives, um, what I would call the salient points, the most important points that I'm going to bring up during the program. And I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and just read through those objectives. That way, as we go through them in the program, they'll reside in your mind a lot more firmly and you'll remember more as the program goes on. So if you take a minute and look over those objectives and come back to the video at this point, that would be a good thing right now. Welcome back. We're going to go through this document fairly carefully and we're going to cover all of the points that I think are the most important issues in the Citizen's Guide to Radon. Now the purpose of this guide is primarily to give the individual homeowner who's not buying or selling a house but who's interested in his own home uh, whether or not there's a radon concentration there, how to measure it. It gives a little bit of information on mitigation and some of the other important issues dealing with the uh, radon problem. So if we can start, if you'll go to your book in the visual section, you'll find that the, uh, the first visual is the one you see here. It's titled A Citizen's Guide to Radon, just a title page. And what I'd like you to do is be there in your book so that as I go through the program, and you think of things you want to ask or things you want to write down or jot down, you can jot them down right there on the visuals and that'll be a really good place to put them. If you do have questions when the program is over, uh, feel free to give us a call and I'll be happy to work with you through whatever questions you might have. So most of the information, if, if not all of the information you're going to see or hear today is based on this document, a Citizen's Guide to Radon. And we'll start off with the EPA recommendations as you see here. First, test your house. It's very easy, and that is the truth. And I brought here a um, charcoal canister, which is a very common method of testing for radon in homes, and it's, it's harder to find anything easier to do in your life than test for radon. Fundamentally, you just take, you peel off this, this tape off the top. Just comes off. I like to put it at the bottom so it's, it's where I can get at it later. And you deploy this detector into the appropriate place in your home for a given amount of time. The instructions on how to do that always come with the detector. So when you get a detector, it comes with instructions to tell you how to do it. And I'm going to make some reflections on that a little later in the program. After a few days of uh, leaving it deployed just like this, just take the tape, put it back on the top, fill out a brief form which gives name and address and times that you deployed it and then, and then retrieved it and send it to the lab. Your radon concentration will come back in the mail uh, within a week or two at most. And so it doesn't get much easier than testing for radon. It goes on to uh, recommend to fix the home, that is, fix the radon concentration if the concentration is found to be four or more in the house. Now the unit, the typical unit, as you see it here, is uh, Pico Curies per liter. And Sometimes I forget to use that unit, and I'll just be talking with the numbers. And, and if I don't make a, a unit with a number, recognize the unit is picocuries per liter. That is the standard unit for measuring radon. And you can see it here, right here in this comment. Fix if the concentration is four or more. Four picocuries per liter is the action level established by the EPA in the United States. That is not to suggest that if the concentration in your home is 3.5, that you're safe and you're golden. That is not true. The lower you can get the concentration, the better off you will be. And it's also true that mitigators who most commonly use this method called subslab depressurization can oftentimes get concentrations down below 2. So if you have a 3.5, a 3.8, or, or 2.9 and you'd like to get it lower, it's considered a good idea to get it as low as you can. Okay. To give you a sense of current estimates that the EPA has published at this point of the number of deaths per year, and you see that I am plotting the number of deaths per year here on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, different categories. And you see that radon is currently estimated 
to produce about 15,000 to 22,000 lung cancer deaths per year. And that is the predominant health hazard due to radon is lung cancer. If you compare it to other kinds of uh, hazards, drunk driving, uh, falls in the home, fires, drownings, etc., you see that radon stands out quite a bit. Now, I do want to point out to you <clears throat> that as of just a week or so ago, uh, EPA has published some new risk estimates which have changed these values for radon a little bit. And I'm including the public version of that report as a few loose pages in the book that you have. So you should find those and read that document, especially the last few paragraphs, at the very end of the program. When you're done with the program, you'll want to read that document. And for those of you who are taking the program for continuing ed credits, you will find that, in, you, you, will find that you have to answer some quiz questions at the very back of the book. And some of those questions refer to these couple of pages um, of the more recent risk estimates as published by the EPA. So they make an alteration to what this chart would actually look like, but not an overwhelming alteration. And it certainly does not in any way diminish the health hazard that radon uh, exposes people to uh, worldwide, actually. Now, <clears throat> it is cancer-causing. Uh, there is no doubt about that. EPA lists it as a known carcinogen, not a probable carcinogen, but a known carcinogen. It's undetectable with human senses. And I brought a radioactive sample with me, just a little sample that I took here out of our radioisotopes lab so that I'd have something to play with. And um, it's undetectable with human senses. You know, you, you can't hear the radioactivity, can't smell it. Uh, I'm not going to try to taste it. And, and you certainly don't see anything other than a little dot. However, a radioactive atom is simply an atom that, on its own, just explodes. And when it does, it gives off lots of pieces. Some of those pieces are called alpha particles, and some are called other things. And uh, because of that, they're easy to detect. And all you need is something on the order of a Geiger counter, which I've brought with me today. So because we can't detect it with our senses, doesn't mean we can't detect it. And um, I think I'm going to take the, just the tube, that's all I need, and hold it near the microphone. And I think you can hear that, noting that it, it's pretty easy. Let me see if I can turn this around so you can see this source right then. If I remove the source, the sounds go away. And so it is relatively very easy to detect. And in a sense, that's a good thing about radioactivity. If you want to detect a radioactive source, it's not too hard to find it. It is the second leading cause of lung cancer, as you see here, uh, this check mark. And um, I don't have to tell you the first leading cause of cancer in the United States. We know full well what it is. And the other interesting thing is if you smoke and you have high radon concentrations that you're exposed to, the risk becomes especially high. I'll quote you some numbers here that don't won't mean a thing to you. Suppose the radon in, that you're exposed to gives you a 10% health risk. Now, don't ask me 10% of what, it doesn't matter. 10%. And you're a smoker and that gives you an additional, let's say, just due to smoking, you have a 30% risk. Then you'd think, because of the smoking and the radon, that the sum of the two would be 40%, and that's roughly where your risk would be. That's not true. The risk goes up in a confounded way. It'll go up to maybe 90% or 95%. The, it's, the risks don't simply add. There's a confounding issue that occurs there. And you'll see that in a little bit when we look at the charts that the EPA has put out. It's found all over the United States. Um, it's due to uranium, which is distributed fairly everywhere in the U.S., and the uranium decays, and it's a solid. It's in the earth, and so it, hasn't, it doesn't have an easy way to get out of the earth, but it decays. It's radioactive. It breaks down, and the pieces that it breaks down into, they're, they're also radioactive, and one of them turns out to be radon, and radon's not a solid. It's a gas. So it becomes a soil gas and has the opportunity to percolate up through the soil and out into the atmosphere. And so there's radon in the atmosphere. And in fact, in the United States, near the surface of the Earth, radon concentrations typically are around 0.4 picocuries per liter. It's not zero. It's about 0.4, just in the outside ear, on the average. Now, as that radon percolates up, 
If you have a house right on top of where there's quite a bit of radon percolating up, then that radon has the opportunity to get into the house. And it can get in through any cracks in the basement floor. Any part of the building envelope that's in contact with the ground is going to allow, in some ways, through joints, through where the conduits come in through the walls, it's going to allow radon to come in. And, and that's how it gets into the house. And since it doesn't get dissolved by the atmosphere in the house, what happens is it tends to collect. And the concentration can get up to reasonably high levels. Um, OK. So um, you can also find radon in water. And uh, that's a secondary effect to the radon in air as the soil gas comes up. This is a lesser effect, but it is still there. And the way it gets in is uh, the water in the ground, let's say you're on a well, and the water in the ground has radon all around it. Well, radon dissolves into water. And so it dissolves into the water, then you turn on your faucet, and your well starts pumping water into the house, and it's bringing the radon with it. The water splashes around, and interestingly enough, even a modest agitation of the water causes the radon to come out of the water. And then it becomes a radon and ear problem. But it's brought into the house via the root of water. That's an issue, and we'll look at that a little bit, too. Here, you'll note the largest exposure is likely to be in the home. And the reason for that is that that may not be the largest concentration to, where you're exposed, to which you're exposed. I don't know what the concentration would be like where you work. Um, or where you do other things. But exposure is a function of the concentration and the time you spend in that concentration. And it's typically assumed that you spend more time at home than you do in any one other location. Uh, for some of you who may be uh, a little bit more of a workaholic, maybe that's not true. But fundamentally, the, the thinking is that your largest exposure is likely to be in the home. So EPA and the Surgeon General of the United States both recommend that all homes below the third floor be tested for radon. And EPA also recommends testing in schools. Now the testing in schools, that protocol is different than the one for the Citizen's Guide to Radon that we're looking at today. The Citizen's Guide to Radon, that's for the homeowner who has a lot of time uh, to do tests and uh, doesn't have to be in a hurry to get the results, for example, typically. Now, schools, of course, they are typically much larger than homes. They have very fairly sophisticated HVAC systems, lots of different levels. It's a different problem. The traffic is different. You've got a lot more kids in schools than you have at home. I certainly believe that would be true. The, uh, so the issues there are a little different. If you want to know how to test for radon in schools, EPA puts out a document called Radon Measurements in Schools. And you can download that document off of the net at epa.gov. So if you go to www.epa.gov, uh, you would have to navigate their site a little bit, but you can get over to Radon Measurements in Schools, and you can download the program right there, or the document right there. OK. Now, it's also important to note that the problem can be fixed. Uh, the EPA has placed a significantly large effort in de into developing methods to solve the problem for the homeowner. Fundamentally, they've come up with a number of techniques, overwhelmingly the most common of which is called sub-slab depressurization. And I've got a few sketches here to show you of how that works. Um, and the concentrations, it's just tremendously effective. I'm going to say it's 98% effective. It's probably even a little higher than that. But it's just incredibly effective mechanism to reduce the radon concentration in the home. And it's not too expensive. And I'll quote some prices here in a little bit. And note here, too, in the second bulleted item, even high levels can be reduced to acceptable levels. And that's true. Even if you have 50 or 100 picocuries per liter in your house, uh, that can be brought down to significantly lower levels, oftentimes below 4 and sometimes below 2. Now, in the issue of new homes, if you're in the process of having a new home built or you're building a new home for yourself, there's an advantage here. Because the home isn't up yet, so you don't know if there's going to be a radon problem or not. However, you can put in what is called radon resistant features prior to or during the period that the house is being built. And in so doing, it's very inexpensive to do that, to put in these radon resistant features. 
And then afterwards, when the house is finished, and you can test the house for radon, if it has a problem, then you can add typically an exhaust fan and maybe a little bit of electric to finish the hookup for the radon mitigation system. And you'll find that that's much less expensive, as you would expect, than trying to mitigate a house that's already up and having to execute a, a little bit of a rehab job. And notice here, all EPA recommends all new homes should be tested after occupancy, even if they have radon-resistant features. Now, how does radon get into the house? I already alluded to this a little bit. It's, uh, you can see here through cracks in the floors, construction joints. I think if you remember that it's a soil gas, then um, you can imagine how it gets into the house through any opening in the building envelope that's in contact with the ground. And then, of course, they also mentioned the water supply, which we've discussed a little bit, and building materials may also outgas radon. Now, building materials is a, is a significantly distant third avenue for radon to get into a house. The predominant method is as a soil gas, it can get into the house. Secondarily, if you're on a well, for example, uh, you might get radon into the house through the radon and water venue. And thirdly, some building materials may outgas radon. And here at East Stroudsburg University a few years back, we did a study on uh, waterproof, water-resistant sheetrock. And one of the things we discovered is that that emits radon gas. Now, it doesn't emit a lot, but it does emit some. So we're aware of at least some building materials that do emit uh, radon. But it's very much a distant third. And here's a schematic that uh, you can see. And of course, you have all these visuals in front of you. So if it's not completely crisp to you, uh, you can still see that um, there are roots here uh, where radon can get into the house. So you see cracks in the basement floor. Uh, floor wall joints, oftentimes there's a, a uh, fringe drain there or something by which water can be allowed to drain out. Sump holes in basements are uh, notorious for allowing radon in. If you're going to have a radon problem, that's, that's one place it can come. Here there's some allusion to radon and water coming into the house, a toilet and a water tank. And um, so these, these, I think, are they're just common sense of how the radon can get into a house. In the U.S. nationwide, the average is about 1 in 15 homes uh, will have a radon concentration greater than 4. Now, East Stroudsburg University is in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania uh, has more radon than most states, I would say. And here, the number of homes that have it is roughly 1 out of 2. Roughly half the homes in Pennsylvania have a radon problem. That is a concentration greater than 4. It would be unwise to say, no matter where you live, that uh, my neighbor on this side, my neighbor on that side, they don't have any radon, so you know, I probably don't have any radon either. That's a mistake. The only way to know, as you see here, the only way to know if your house has a radon concentration is to test. Now, testing your home is easy. You can see that. It's easy, it's fast, and there's a couple of methods. I'm going to take a two minutes, three minutes, talking about how to do that. I've already described to you how you can use a charcoal canister. There are other kinds of test kits. This is a uh, charcoal vial, works just like a canister, has charcoal in it, adsorbs the radon. To activate this, you just have to unscrew the cap. That's it. And you deploy this in the appropriate place in your house for the correct amount of time. Instructions come with, the, with these test kits. The um, short-term tests are tests that run anywhere from 2 to 90 days. And a long-term test is a measurement that lasts greater than 90 days. You may also want to, if you don't want to test the home yourself, if you're concerned that you might not do the test quite right, you can contact a uh, radon professional. And one way to do that is call your state radon office. One of the nice things about the Citizen's Guide to Radon document is in the back of the document are all of the phone numbers for radon offices in each of the states. And so it's easy. You have a nice resource there. It's easy to uh, go down and, and pick out the right number. If you're in what we call a regulated state, that is states that by their own agencies certify individuals to do radon testing, then that state can send you a list of certified radon testers. If you're not in a certified state, a regulated state, then um, you can go to EPA's homepage again, epa.gov, and search, search for two private 
certifying agencies who certify individuals on a national level and you can contact those agencies and they can give you a list of who is certified in your state by those private agencies. Okay. Now I'm just going to show you how to use a test kit. Uh, actually, I've already demonstrated to you how to use a test kit. It's really easy. But the, uh, the obvious things here, you see item number one, read and follow the instructions. Well, that seems transparent, right? So here, this charcoal test kit came in this envelope, and I opened it earlier because I always have trouble opening these, these darn packs. And it has a set of instructions here. Let me just open this up. Usually it's about a half a page. Half a page of instructions actually starts here, test procedure. Uh, we don't have to be able to see that. Uh, whatever test kit you get is going to have a set of instructions. And um, just follow the instructions. It's, re it's really very easy. Item number two, establish closed house conditions. Now, the purpose for establishing closed house conditions for short-term tests, that is for tests less than 90 days, is uh, to prevent too much ventilation from occurring in the house. So closed house conditions require that you keep your windows and doors closed except for normal entry and exit. Part of closed house conditions also is uh, identified here in statement number three. Do not operate devices that bring in outdoor air, whole house fans for example, don't do that because that will uh, slant the radon concentration in your house tremendously. Uh, small exhaust fans that operate for short periods are okay, so your bathroom fan, you go in, you take a shower for 10 minutes, you're going to use the exhaust fan. Uh, if you're doing some cooking, you, know, you might have your exhaust fan running in the kitchen. Small exhaust fans are okay. If you already have a radon mitigation system in the house, that system is to be on. If the test is very short, that is two to three days, uh, or less than four days, I think is the way it's often written, two to three day test, you should establish closed house conditions 12 hours prior to, to deploying the detector and opening it up, so 12 hours ahead of time. Some caveats, um, item number seven here, do not perform a two to three day test if, a, if unusually severe weather is forecast. If high winds are expected, if, if you're going to get a hurricane or the weather report says tomorrow expect high winds, uh, heavy rains, then in those cases don't start your test then. And the reason for that is rainfall and high winds have been shown to accentuate the radon concentration in the house significantly. And that would be a very unusual set of values for your house and not common at all. The item number eight, uh, lowest lived in level. Do the measurement in the lowest lived in level in the house. That's the way the citizen's guide to radon document reads. Do it in the lowest lived in part of the house. So if you have a basement and you never use it, that's not your lowest lived in area. The lowest lived in area would probably, in that case, be the first floor. However, some states and uh, some states require that you test in the lowest livable space. And that means that if you have a basement and it's livable without any significant modifications to it, then that would be called the lowest livable space. And the way you can determine whether or not your state recommends to test in the lowest livable or the lowest lived in area is go to the, the document, the Citizens Guide to Radon, way in the back, look up the phone numbers, call your state radon office and ask them, hey, where should I make the test? And that will tell you. You can see item number nine, do not do it in kitchens or baths. And the reason is some detectors are very sensitive to the amount of humidity that's in the room. And uh, if they collect too much humidity, then it's possible that the test can be null and void. Uh, so not in kitchens and baths, typically also not in hallways. Um, make sure the detector is deployed 20 inches above the floor, away from drafts, heat, humidity, exterior walls, furnaces. Don't go in the basement and set it on your furnace. Uh, make sure you put it in an undisturbed area. And the reason is you don't, want, you don't want the detector being someplace where your dog can get at it, lick it, kick it around, or your kids might play with it, or anything like that. You want it to be in the same place when you go to pick it up as when you left it and not damaged in any way. Reseal it and return it. And I've already shown you how to do that. It takes all of a few seconds. Now, the steps to take. Here's the, here's the protocol on how to do the testing. The first thing to do is to take a short-term test. Now, that's 
of course, to test anything less than 90 days. If you're using a charcoal canister, such as I'm holding here, you'll find in the instructions they tell you to deploy it for four, five, six, seven days, but not much more than that. So you're going to do a, a deployment on the order of, of, of several days is what's probably going to happen. Uh, whether, if you use a, a charcoal vial like this, you'll see in the instructions, there's a, there's a time during a deployment period that's recommended. The, um, now, after you do your short-term test, if the result is greater than or equal to four, that's four or more, recommendation is take a follow-up test. Now, the goal here is to recognize that one piece of information is not enough to make a judgment on, on whether or not you want to mitigate the radon problem in your house. So the recommendation, well, let's, all right, we've got a value here. If it's more than four, let's check it again. Now, if the first short-term test is more than eight, make the follow-up test a short one. If it's less than or equal to eight, you can make the follow-up test short or long. Now, the, the logic behind this is suppose you do your first test and the radon concentration comes out and it's 100. Okay, well, that's a pretty significant radon concentration. And uh, so do you want to do a long-term test, say a one-year test, in order to determine whether or not uh, you, you do have a radon problem, that is to confirm your first measurement? And at those kinds of high concentrations, the answer is no. You don't want to wait too long. Let's do another test. Let's do a short-term test and confirm the value quickly. There's no sense being exposed for an entire year more uh, at higher radon concentrations, which is why you have these two cases, steps two and three. Just two more steps to the uh, testing protocol, and that is if the follow-up test was a long-term measurement, fix the house, this is the EPA recommendation, fix the house if the follow-up result by itself was four or more. They're recommending mitigate it. If the follow-up test was short, then you take that value and you average it with the first short-term measurement. Then if the average of both short-term tests is greater than or equal to four, then the recommendation is uh, mitigate it in that case too. Okay. Just to give you a few <clears throat> perspectives um, that you'll find in the guide, the average indoor radon level in the U.S. is estimated to be about 1.3. It's actually just a tad under that, rounds up to 1.3. Outdoor air in the U.S., I've mentioned before, is about 0.4. Congress has set a goal of indoor levels no greater than outdoor levels. That is, Congress has said the goal that we will strive for is to make the radon concentration in the house no more than what it is outside. Well, if you think about that, and I have, that's going to be a pretty difficult task. That would require that we take one, be 100% effective in preventing any radon gas from getting into the house uh, through the soil or the water or building materials. That's going to take quite some effort. I, I, I don't believe, and it says, it says it here, not currently feasible. That I would certainly subscribe to. And one additional remark, most homes can be lowered to below two. And that's quite true. Most homes can get down to below two. It's an interesting note here, this next one. If the average of two short-term tests is 4.1, two short-term tests, if the average is 4.1, then you've got a 50-50 chance that the year-round average is still less than four. Because short-term tests don't tell you the average annual value. They just tell you the value that existed during that time. If you want to know what the average annual value is, you'd have to take an annual measurement. You'd have to deploy a detector for a year. Now, charcoal detectors, such as the canister and the vial, they're not suitable for a year-long measurement. Uh, one method, and there are several, one's electrets. Another is alpha track detectors, and here I'm holding up an alpha track detector. And it's just a little housing here, and inside is a little plastic strip. And the radon gets into this detector, and or the, the ear in the room gets into the, into the detector, and of course it brings the radon with it. And as the radon decays, that is, as it explodes, it leaves little scratch marks in the plastic strip. And the more scratch marks you have, the more radon you must, you must have had in the home. And so uh, these are suitable for long-term measurements of a year and longer, if you like. So you could get alpha track 
uh, detectors for doing long-term measurements, and they're only a little bit more expensive than the charcoal canisters. So the point being made here is that if, too short, if you have two short-term tests and they come in around four, just a tad above four, as you see here, there's still a chance that your average annual concentration is below four. The EPA, nevertheless, still recommends that if the average of the two short-term tests is four or more, the recommendation is mitigate the house. Note here, no level of radon is considered safe. If your living patterns change, that is, uh, suppose you've tested in the lowest lived-in level and you've never used your basement, and then next year you renovate the basement and you, you decide to put in whatever you put in on there, a recreation room, and now you're going to be using that. Well, you should test that because now that's the new lived-in, lowest lived-in space. My recommendation would be test before you do the renovation because if you have to put in a mitigation system, it's going to be easier and less expensive if, uh, if you do it before the renovation is done in the basement. And here you'll notice the last item, test again sometime in the future, even if your result is less than four. So if you test it today and you find you get two and a half and you say, all right, I'm not going to, I'm okay, I'm not going to do a radon mitigation, I don't feel like I want to get it down below two or whatever. The, um, doesn't mean that later on you might not have a radon concentration which is higher. So at some distant future time or some later time, maybe not too distant, you should test again. Now there is another document that's out. It's called the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide to Radon and you see the front cover of it here. And um, this is a protocol that the EPA has put out which tells you how to test for radon concentrations if you're buying or selling a home. The protocol is a little bit different. Of course, the physics is the same. The problem is the same. The mitigation methods described are the same as in the Citizen's Guide to Radon. But the, do you put out one detector or two detectors? Do you put them out simultaneously? That kind of thing is, is discussed in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide to Radon. And the reason there's a change or difference in the protocols is that in a real estate transaction, you don't have the freedom of waiting 30 days to do a measurement and getting a result back and then doing a follow-up measurement later on. The, there's a time of the essence usually in the agreement of sales. And the home buyer may only have 10 or 15 days to execute all of the tests or inspections that they want to do on a house. Uh, so they don't have a lot of time. And so the protocol is a little bit different. If you're thinking about buying or selling a house, then this would be the protocol to follow. And this document, you can get it off of epa.gov. You can download it right off the net. You can print it right off the net. Uh, it's, and it's a great document. Okay. Some comments about radon and water. Radon and water, as I described a few minutes ago, is mostly an inhalation risk. That is, you get the radon comes in with the water, and you're taking a shower. Well, that agitates the water pretty significantly, and so the radon comes out of the water. How much of it? Geez, almost all of it. I've seen numbers between 70 and 100 percent of the radon gets out of the water in a shower. So um, the radon, it doesn't matter how much is getting out, most of it is getting out of the water and it becomes a radon and air problem. So now you're in the shower and you're inhaling these can be potentially relatively high concentrations. So fundamentally the radon and water issue becomes a radon and air inhalation risk issue. However, there is also uh, the possibility of an ingestion risk. That is, if you're drinking the water and it has radon in it, well, you can see how that water is going to get in the vicinity of other organs in your body. And there's the potential for other kinds of hazards due to ingestion. And you see here, inhalation risk is recognized to be larger than the ingestion risk. Now, which water is going to be the biggest problem? Groundwater is going to be the biggest problem. If your water comes from a reservoir, it's much less likely to have a radon problem in it than a groundwater. And the reason is, as I mentioned, if you disturb the water very much, the radon comes out of the water. So in a reservoir, you have the wind blowing over the water, um, and, and the reservoir holds a lot of water, and the radon has an opportunity to decay before it starts going down the pipes over to your house. And it's not as likely to have a radon in water problem if you're using surface water. But if you're using well water, you have your own well, then there's, the water doesn't get disturbed very much between the pump and the faucet. 
and there's very few places for the radon gas to come out of the water. So that's a much more likely place. If you're getting municipal water or a community water supply and you're concerned about the radon in water, then you can check with them. Just give them a call and ask them what they're doing about the radon in water issue. Are they measuring it? Are they treating it? Lots of municipalities aerate their water and the, that, would, that would eliminate a great part of the radon and water problem if they have it. The recommendation that EPA puts out is if your house result, if your radon and air measurement was greater than or equal to four and your water supply is a well, then test your water. Okay? Now, to mitigate water, <coughs> is, um, there are two methods to do it and two places you can do it, point of entry and point of use. I'm going to talk about the point of entry first. And this is, let's suppose you're on a well and the radon is coming in here, I mean the water, the well water, comes into the house here. Then the idea is to put a charcoal canister here, a fairly tall vial of it, it stands about four or five feet tall, and the water goes through the charcoal, comes back out and then back into the house. And that charcoal will remove a lot of the radon. And you see here in the visual that you, I hope you're looking at, you'll see I've got a drawing here of a, an activated charcoal tank, a little sketch, and you can take a look at that and see, um, get a sense about how that works. A second method is an aeration unit, and I have a little schematic of it here. And here what's done is the water, the water comes into the, into the house, here's the pipe coming into the house, and you take it, you put it into a big tank, a good sized tank, and you disturb it in any one of a number of ways. The radon gas comes out because the water's been disturbed, and then you, you have an exhaust fan, typically, that will draw that gas out, and then the water is allowed to enter the house from that point on. And uh, so, and you can see a little schematic of it here, again, same visual. Another method of uh, treating radon in water is at the point of use. Uh, I don't see this very much. Frankly, I have never seen this. And that is the idea would be, suppose you want to eliminate the radon in your kitchen sink from coming out of the water in your kitchen sink. And uh, so you could put a small charcoal trap there, and that would assuming it's properly sized, that would take most of the radon out and that would eliminate the water there, the radon and water problem there. However, it doesn't solve the radon and water problem anyplace else in the house. And I'm sure that's why I haven't seen that in use at all. I've seen lots of places where the, um, the radon mitigation, the radon and water mitigation is at the point of entry. Now, <clears throat> the, um, the mitigation technique for radon and air um, is described quite well, in what's called the Consumer's Guide to Radon Reduction. I'm going to give you a little description of it here as well. Now, this is another EPA document. You can go to epa.gov. You can print it out right from their site, uh, the Consumer's Guide to Radon Reduction. The most common method is subslab depressurization. I've got a schematic. I'm going to show you with that in just a second. Very straightforward. Cost range, you can see here, with average values indicated around $1,200. There are some special skills uh, in doing a, a sub-slab depressurization method. You've got to drill a hole through a concrete slab. You've got to run some electric. Um, and the recommendation is use a contractor. Where are you going to get a mitigation contractor? Same place you got a home tester. And that is you can call your state radon office, get a list. If you're in a certified state, they'll have a list. If you're in, an, or in a regulated state. If you're in an unregulated state, you can go to epa.gov's uh, home page, go to their site, and search for uh, agencies that certify individuals for radon mitigation. And then you can contact those agencies and uh, find a contractor that way. Uh, you will also be recommended here in this document to test again after mitigation. After all, how would you know that the uh, mitigation system is working if you don't test afterwards? So you need to test afterwards. Retest your home every two years. That's an interesting recommendation. I think it's a good idea. Uh, if you're on a well, you should be testing your well water every couple of years uh, for bacteriological infections or whatever else you, um, you might want to deal with or test for. But retest your home every two years. I think it's a very good idea. Okay. And I want to go back and make a remark about uh, testing, again, after mitigation. If you're going to have a mitigation done, then you'll definitely want the consumer's guide to um, radon mitigation, and you can get that off the EPA homepage. 
uh, off their site in any case. And get their uh, consumer's guide to radon reduction is the title of the document. And it'll tell you there how to test after mitigation. Uh, you don't test immediately after the mitigation system is put in. You wait 24 hours and then you can start your test. And you don't want to wait too long after the mitigation. So if you look at that guide, it'll tell you when to do it, when to do the test after mitigation. Just to give you a little schematic, and you have this visual in front of you, so um, I hope it's, it's crisp enough for you to read carefully. And you'll see here that fundamentally, it's, you just cut a hole through the basement slab, if you have a slab, and you run a, usually a typically a four inch pipe, and you can see it runs out, and you get it out through the house somewhere, put an exhaust fan in, and you exhaust the gases out from beneath the slab, out of the house, before they have an opportunity to get into the house. Sometimes more than one suction point is needed. You should seal uh, any places that the radon would have an opportunity to get into the house, um, during the mitigation uh, installation, you should do the sealing. And again, get the consumer's guide to radon reduction. It gives you a lot of details on what you ought to be doing. If you have a uh, sump hole, you can get a cover for that. And these you can buy right off the shelf. Companies sell these right off in, with the intent, the purpose for being radon mitigations. And, um, and it's really very straightforward. But do get the consumer's guide to radon reduction because there are some subtleties about mitigation systems. For example, the, uh, where should the exhaust point be? Well, you have to be careful because the radon soil concentration can be very high. You may have five or six, maybe 10 picocuries per liter in your house, but the soil concentration can be hundreds of picocuries per liter and higher too. And so if you exhaust that out, you're exhausting air, which has a significant amount of radon in it. So you want to make sure it exhausts and that it gets dissolved into the atmosphere and doesn't get re-entrained back into the house. You don't want to put the exhaust point a foot away from, from your bedroom window because then some of that radon could come right back into the house. You have to watch for that. Okay. Some of the risks. <clears throat> Predominantly, uh, it's lung cancer. That is the predominant risk due to radon. And so you can see here, it underlines, in fact, that radon in the air is is the risk that we're most concerned about. It's a function of the concentration to which you're exposed and the time spent in that concentration and whether or not you're a smoker. I'm going to show you a couple of charts here which will um, delineate for you what the EPA's current published charts indicate as far as the risk if you're a smoker or a non-smoker. Let's take a look at that. Now you have this visual in front of you as well. And you'll see here, you see here, let's take a look. If you have a radon concentration of about four, and you live in this concentration for your lifetime, about two people, that's out of a thousand, if you look at the legend here, if a thousand people who never smoked were exposed to this level over a lifetime, about two people would get lung cancer. If the concentration's eight, about three people get lung cancer. Concentration's 20, about eight people could get lung cancer. I, I can remember this, and you don't have to remember this, of course, but I remember this pretty easily because the number of people who get lung cancer out of 1,000 is roughly half the concentration to which they're exposed. So concentration of four, two people uh, could get lung cancer. Concentration of 20, using my rule of thumb, you'd expect to see 10. Now here they're saying about eight. So that fits into the, in the statistically in, into the values that we would expect. If you look at the case, if you're a smoker, Let's just look at the four. If you're a smoker and you're exposed to radon concentration of four, about 29 people could get lung cancer. For a non-smoker, it was two. This is roughly 15 times as much. For a concentration of 20, remember we were looking at eight here, eight people for non-smokers. Here it's 135, again roughly 15 times as much. So if you're a smoker and you're exposed to radon, the risk of getting lung cancer due to the radon is 15 times more than if you're a non-smoker. If you're a smoker, it's 15 times more than if you're a non-smoker. And you can look at some of the other details on these kinds of uh, charts. The, the document also recommends don't wait to do a radon test, and that's a darn good recommendation. Do not wait to do a radon test. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody who spent the last few months of their lives with lung cancer. I have a good friend of mine passed away about two or three years ago due to that. And uh, I'll tell you, if you saw someone 
struggled for the last few months, you would test for radon immediately. And if you were a smoker, it would give you a lot of motivation to quit. It's not too late. Uh, I remember uh, giving a talk some years ago on the radon issue and the health risks, and some fellow in the audience stood up with a question afterwards. He said, I'm 65 years old. Why should I test my house now? And, and it was an interesting point that he made. Truth of the matter is, let's look at the case of smoking first. If you're a smoker, and let's say you are 65, doesn't matter. As soon as you stop smoking, it's well known that you start feeling better. All right, well, maybe you go through some struggles in getting out of the addiction, but as soon as you stop, things start getting better. You start feeling better, you, and, and it's well known that you do get better almost starting immediately. And the same is true with radon. As soon as you get the radon concentration down, your risk drops off abruptly, and that's a good thing. And EPA, you see here, does make a reflection, stop smoking. Now, <clears throat> there are some myths that are listed in this document, uh, the Citizen's Guide to Radar, and I think some of them still exist a little bit. Uh, some of them have diminished over the years, but some have still continue to exist. Here's one. The document lists about 10 of them, and I'm only picking out some of them. You can go to the document and look at the others. Uh, one myth, scientists aren't sure radon really is a problem. That's just not true. That is not true. The uh, Center for Disease Control, the American Medical Association, the American Lung Association, the overwhelming majority of health physicists that I've spoken with uh, all agree that radon causes lung cancer uh, deaths each year. There is very little debate in that regard. Another myth, radon test kits are not reliable. Well, when radon became a household word in the uh, mid-80s, the, uh, there were some test kits that were not reliable, and that is true. However, the industry has matured significantly, and now radon test kits are very reliable and quite precise and accurate. And you can see here, they can generally read down to less than one picocurie per liter. You can find them easily. Excuse me, uh, hardware stores have them. Uh, you can find them in mail order. If you're on the net, go to radon test kits. You'll find some there. Call your state radon office, and they can identify where you can find um, radon test kits as well. And I've shown you, they're, they're darn easy to use. Another myth, houses with radon problems can't be fixed. And I do remember hearing this in the very beginning of the radon problem some 20 or so years ago. Um, Houses with radon problems can't be fixed. Well, that's just not true. Hundreds of thousands of homes, that's a lot of homes, have already been fixed. Subslab depressurization is the most common. It is typically a simple installation. Uh, if you have a mitigator, do it. Oftentimes, two guys will come in, and by 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're gone. They're done, and they do a nice, handsome job. The costs, $800 to $2,500, and you'll see values... Um, in that range. Uh, anyway, that's what's given in, the, in this particular guide. One other myth, radon is a problem in only certain parts of the country. That's not true. Radon, as you see here, high radon levels have been found in every state. And the only way to know is to test. Don't be fooled by your neighborhood individuals, your neighbors telling you, that uh, they checked for radon, they got a two. It's okay, they're not going to do anything about it. And the other neighbor got a two. You could be sitting on a house with a 50. Uh, the only way to know is, in fact, to test. And the last one I've actually already made a reflection on. I've lived in my house for so long, it doesn't make sense to take action now. That's, uh, that's sort of an empty remark in this day and age. That pretty much ends this uh, radon training program. And for those of you who are taking the program for continuing ed credits, the next thing you'll need to do is to go to the quiz, which you'll find in the back of the book, answer the questions, put your answers on the answer page that's provided, and either mail or fax that back to us, and we'll get you your award letters in short order. Thank you very much.